shop, we can't lose, you can't win, if you snooze, so do more, and say less, so get up, and let's work, and be the best, yeah, you're tuned in to the Steve Gunner Podcast, yeah, the Steve Gunner Podcast, you're tuned in to the Steve Gunner Podcast, get up, it's the Steve Gunner Podcast. Good day to all and welcome to another episode of the Steve Gunter Podcast, where we discuss the steps, the strategies, and the mindset of real estate investing tailor-made for the pro athlete. We appreciate your time. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with me, and for that, I am grateful. I'm your host, Steve Gunter, and it's an honor and privilege to be with you, and today, I am sitting with a very special guest. First of all, H-Town's finest luxury real estate agent, investor, and by the way, super mom to three wonderful boys uh, who are extraordinary athletes, I must say. Uh, But without further ado, I want to say hello and welcome Alicia Jammer. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing well. It's Valentine's Day. It's my son's birthday. So all is good. All is well. Uh, Look, Valentine's, and it's so funny that you say that because there's a couple of people on my team whose children are actually also, uh, their birthday is on Valentine's Day. And I was meeting with the customer and his daughter's birthday is on Valentine's Day. I said, how's everybody? Babies on, made on love day. (laughs) But uh, I guess that's the right thing, right? So that's good. Anyway, anyway, Alicia, uh, thank you so much for your time. Really do appreciate you being here today. And look, I want to first start with just kind of talking about you. You are a machine, man. Uh, (laughs) I don't know what your schedule is like, but I'm sure it must be. But I, you know, I, I, you're at, you're at the gym at like probably three in the morning and then you're like, you know, you're running a mountain or something and you're doing this and you're doing that. And then you got the boys and then you got your business. How how do you make it all fit? First of all, you know, it's crazy that you asked that. And a lot of days, honestly, I'm shocked at what I get done in a day, but Part of my process in getting everything done is starting my day super early, like you said, with my morning workout. Usually that's a non-negotiable for me unless I have to be somewhere super early and the timing just doesn't align. Today I didn't go because I wanted to make breakfast for my son. So when he came downstairs, he had breakfast. Um, So I didn't go to my morning workout. But my first alarm goes off at 4.15, the second one at 4.30. and that's how I kickstart my day. And I have this, <laughs> yeah, I have this 415 and 430. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and I have that conversation with my boys because they're always asking me, like, you don't have to go work out that early. Like sometimes they call me a try hard, whatever. Um, but I always remind them that it keeps me in the mindset of no, I don't have to do it but I use my fitness and that workout time as a, my me time. And it's training my mind that in life, there are lots of things, especially within our business that we don't want to do, but we have to do to get our clients to the finish line. So it's a constant, just keeping my mind in that mindset that no, I don't have to go do it, but it keeps me focused on and reminded that, there are times when I don't want to do certain things, but I have to do them in order for my business to continue to thrive. So that's how I use it. And I tell them like in life, you're going to experience those things. No one's always going to make you go do something. It's going to be up to you. And this is just a way that I, I keep my mind trained that way. What, who, who led you down this path? How, how, how did you develop this mindset? Would you say was it parents? Think- was it just you know, experiences over the years? I think a combination of all. Um, Growing up, I was very, super, super organized, very rigid in schedule. My parents didn't have to wake me up to go to school, none of that stuff. So I've always had um, 
that sense about myself and seeing both of my parents work really hard. Both of my parents got up super early. My dad worked shift work. My mom would get up five, five fifteen, be gone out the door. So I think subconsciously you're you're seeing these things. And then as you progress and you get older, it becomes habit. I've been in sports or around sports all my life. Since I started cheering when I was five, mm -hmm. um, all the way up till I was a senior in high school. So always super active. Um, and again, being around and doing things that sometimes you, you don't want to do, like nobody wants to go to practice every day of the week, but sports has always been that, or working out has kind of kept me in that mindset that no, there are times I don't want to do certain things, but we have to do them. You know, to that point of sports kind of creating this, this schedule for you and Ultimately, it's funny because every athlete that I know, they still, for the most part, live according to that schedule. And, and it seems like it's translated into your life as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I was married to a professional athlete. So I've been like, again, I've been around it all my life. So I've seen the high school schedule. I've been around the college schedule. I've been around the NFL schedule. And it does when you have someone telling you where to be, when to be, how to be, it becomes second nature. And so, yes, there is for some guys I've seen, there's a huge transition period that happens when you're no longer in the league and nobody's telling you what to do, where to be how to do something. And so I've seen both sides. I've seen some people stay on that schedule. And then I've also seen where it's hard to adjust to what I call mm. like the civilian life, because you don't have someone telling you what to do and a rigid schedule that you must follow. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. You know, thinking about that for just one moment, you know, for those that don't adjust, and, and they constantly do need that type of direction. Um, ha have you seen any of that amongst your, your clients even, just kind of, you know, needing someone that could, that could guide them a bit better? Most of my clients, I would say a large portion of them are still active. Um, I have dealt with a handful that are retired. And so you, I get to see the difference, um, you know, being as an outsider, there was a time when I was the insider and got mm -hmm. to see it firsthand. But now as the outsider, I've had conversations with my active players um, about what retirement looks like, what I've experienced, what I've seen just from, I mean, I have tons of friends um, that I've made over the years that, you know, at this point they are retired. So I've seen both. Um, and it's very interesting to have those conversations with them about what that looks like and just kind of guiding them on next steps based on what I've seen from, you know, past experiences or friends that I've made around the league. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. You know, um, speaking of which, you have been an investor yourself and you have purchased property, revitalized those properties. And, and I presume either rented them or, or sold them. Uh, what, what, what has been your experience with that? And maybe perhaps some of the, 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 the lessons you've learned along the way. Um, one of the first things Mike's husband and I did when he got drafted, we purchased a townhome out in Austin. And, you know, for the most part, it was where we were going to go when we, when, you know, off season or when we were finished. Um, and then when we got divorced, that was kind of part of the settlement. So it came to me. Um, so mm -hmm. this is, I'm giving an example of a particular property. And when I got into real estate, after we got divorced, obviously I'm sure you've seen when you go to rentals and you're showing rentals, you see the good, the bad <laughs> and mm -hmm. everything in between. And you really see how tenants take care or not take care of a property that does not belong to them. And so I always had this idea that I don't want to be responsible for tenants that mess up my property. I've seen pets destroy properties. <laughs> um, and so I 
did the tenant thing and it just wasn't for me at that time. Um, I think I was very inexperienced. And when I first got into real estate, I didn't understand that avenue of wealth because I had a financial advisor. They were managing money. I was doing the typical things that people do, you know, invest in stocks and have a small diversified portfolio. Sure. But I wasn't looking at real estate as one of those avenues. And I was actually, and even now when I have conversations with athletes, nobody told us back then, like, hey, you know, while you're playing, you should be buying like a property a year. Mm -hmm. Nobody's telling us that it was just your basic, you hire an advisor and they're doing the basic things. And so now how I'm educating is like, if you're playing and I'm working with an athlete right now who, you know, bought a home with me and he's like, I want to invest in real estate. What can I do? And I'm like, Hey, let's, let's, let me show you some duplex ideas here in Houston. But I didn't, I wasn't educated. So I didn't understand that avenue of wealth was my point. And um, I eventually rented it out and sold it. And now at this age, being 10 years in real estate, I'm kicking myself because, <laughs> no, I mean, big time kicking myself mm -hmm. sure. because it was in a prime location in Austin, down the street from Dell Computers. If anybody wow. has ever been to Austin, Austin is now becoming the new, what we call the Silicon Valley of Texas. And my condo was maybe 10, 15 minutes away. Ooh. Probably worth triple the amount now, but I, again, uh. not being educated. So that's where I now take that real estate advisor role and say, hey, let's talk about what life after football looks like. And I've had those conversations and for some, it's they can, their ideas of what that looks like are kind of all over the place. So it's working with their advisors and educating them on the possibilities and potential because you're not going to play forever. So mm -hmm. what, what are we going to do so that you can have a steady income, you know, after football? So that was one well, example of. Yeah, that's, you know, that's so interesting, Alicia, because you're, you're so right. And, you know, I, I, I appreciate you being transparent and sharing that story because it's, look, you don't know what you don't know at the time that you didn't, don't know it. And, and so, you know, you got this property and you don't realize at the time, at least how valuable it really is. Um, but you know, I want to segue to something else uh, that you that you mentioned in your riff, which is, you know, the athletes, they're making this income today. And this is an income that it's not forever. You know, at some point that is going to change and hopefully it changes into something for the better, uh, whether it's, you know, their next venture um, as a professional or it's, you know, assets that have been accumulated over the years. Um, you talked about how you sit down with these athletes and you explain to them as well as obviously sitting down with their financial advisor and explaining to them, you know, hey, guys, we need to consider this essentially setting up a game plan. Um, wh what are I, three steps uh, or, you know, a few steps, if you don't mind um, stating what that looks like for the athlete, what should they be thinking about while they're still actively playing? So the first step, and I'm going to use an example from one of my athletes, because everything, usually athletes typically have a home base and where they're playing is typically not their home, ba home base. Right. So I first ask, where are you from? So I had a client two years ago, he had signed like a two year deal to be here in Houston. When I, I picked him up from the hotel and originally he wanted to rent rightfully. So he's only going to be here two years. That's what his mind frame was. I'm probably, he's at the end of his career. He had already played like 10 plus years. So he's nearing the end. And when we talked about the rental market, I said, Hey, our rental market here in Houston is pretty competitive. 
I mean, and I know around the U.S., it is seemingly just as competitive as the home buying process was during COVID. And I said, I'll show you the rentals, but I also want to give you another option. If your taste, that rental is going to be probably three plus grand based on his preferences and taste, right? Mm -hmm. There are some opportunities where you can purchase a nice three-story, two-story, um, single-family home kind of in the city that looks like a townhome. It's just not attached. But there's a lot of areas in Houston where they're revitalizing and building up. And I said, there are some opportunities where you could potentially purchase a property. You're going to be living in it here for while you're playing. When you're done, you could potentially, that's your segue into becoming a landlord and building wealth outside of what your financial advisor is mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at me like, hmm, he had already, his home base was not Texas. He has a bunch of acreage in, I want to say Alabama. Um, so we looked at rentals and the next time we went out, he was like, I do, I think you're right. Let's take a look at some homes. So we did that and he eventually purchased a home. He's no longer with the Texans after that one year but he is leasing that property out um, now. So, hey, he has a property now worth about half a million dollars and it's segueing him and keep getting his mind frame into, A, I'm not playing anymore. B, what else can I do mm -hmm. where I can have residual income coming in? And I said, you're not here to be a flipper and you know oversee a project and you don't have people that you trust here because you don't really know anybody here but you can be a landlord and have somebody manage your property so finding out talking to the player the first step is like where is your home base and hey let's show them what rent the rental market looks like based on their taste because it's usually not cheap <laughs> mm -hmm. and what can you get for a property for that same amount of money that you would be spending on rent and, and showing can I pause you just for a second Alicia I want to I, I, I want to underscore something that you just said too so so this client went into uh, a purchase as opposed to renting but and, and now today uh, he's perhaps still leasing that particular property uh, or leasing it out excuse me but I, I think one thing that I don't want to uh, gloss over is the mortgage rate on it. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the mortgage rate for a primary residence is significantly different than on an investment property. Correct? Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. investing is always going to be a higher interest rate. I will say this, he purchased cash again. He's been in the league ah. 10 plus years has mm -hmm. made a ton of money. Um, and so he was like, I don't need a mortgage. And after talking with his financial advisor, he was like, they decided that he should pay cash. So he mm -hmm. paid cash. So now it's just bringing in income for him. And he didn't have to worry about mortgage rate. But for those that do get a invest in, investment loan, there are, A, you need to shop around. Um, don't just go with the first. Because um, I see a lot of times they'll be like, well, my financial advisor got it. He already got the loan. I'm like, and then I talk to them and I'm like, hey, let's shop it around and see if we can get you the best rate. If you're going to be living here, like you said, if you're going to be playing here and living here for that year, you can make this your primary residence for that year and right. get that and get your regular interest rate versus an investment rate. So there are conversations that have to be had so that they understand the difference because most of them don't. Um, right. But if you're just here, whether it's a duplex, I mean, if it's a duplex, if they're interested in a duplex, hey, live in one side for a year, get your regular interest rate, and then you're free to, you know, lease it out and move out and go on about your business. And now you're potentially having, you know, two people, two renters after that year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are very, there are various ways to build wealth in real estate, no matter where you are, it doesn't have That's to be good. taxes. So That's you good. just have to get with the right people and have a team to support you. It's not just me talking to the athlete or client, whether they be an athlete or not. It's, 
hey, do you finding out who that who's on their team? Do you have an advisor? Do you have an agent? Let's get everybody on the same page and work together for your best interest. One of the things that I I was super impressed by when I was um, preparing for our chat today was the amount of information that you have on your website. Um, it, look, and I'm not patronizing you. That is one of the most extraordinary listing uh, packages or booklets, flip book, booklets that I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it's huge, Alicia. I mean, it's, 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 there's so much information, but it's very well done very well presented and you do not leave there without fully understanding how you operate uh, and and what you and your team can provide. Uh, let's talk about the sale process when it's time to sell that property in said location. Um, you know what what what's your common steps? I mean obviously once they take a look at, that they're like, they're probably going to leave away with like, oh, I, I, I know who I'm picking as my agent. Well, thank you. <laughs> For me, when I got divorced and I moved back to Texas, yes, I had bought and sold many homes. Not one person, agent, financial advisor, realtor, ever sat us down and explained the home buying or selling process. Mm -hmm. It was, hey, this is the person you use, you sign documents, and at some point you end up at a closing table. So very naive about the process because everybody else handles things. A lot of times, everybody handles everything for the athlete, right? My ex-husband, mm -hmm. you don't have to do anything. And so when I moved to Texas and I bought my first house, I had reached out to a friend and said, hey, I'm moving back to Texas. I need a realtor. And even then, showed me a few homes. I like this one. I sent it to my advisor. Seemed like 30 days later, I was at the closing table. Mm. I couldn't tell anyone what, all I knew is I just bought a house. So when I started trying to figure out when I moved here, figuring out what I was going to do with my life, right? I was now newly divorced, three small kids. I knew probably an eight to five, like traditional job would not work for me just because of how little the boys were and wanting to be there for all the things for them. Because we had done that process so many times, I had talked to my sisters about it because both of them are in real estate fields different aspects. I have one in eminent domain and one in property mm -hmm. management. And so I was like, I loved the looking at homes. When I lived in San Diego, I would go to open houses just to look. I love design, seeing, you know, the trends. And so my sister was like, well, why don't you go get your real estate license? And I was like, hmm, okay, sounds good. <laughs> so um, I ended up going to real estate school, got my license. And once I got my license, I said, my focus is education mm. because I had never been educated and I had to re I had to educate myself on what that looked like because you're talking to, you could be talking to someone who's bought and sold many homes, a first time home buyer, somebody in between, but things change. And you, as you know, in our industry mm -hmm. every single day. So mm -hmm. I had to reeducate myself on what I would desire if I was looking for an agent at now this particular time in my life. And that's how I built my business by education. And again, it means educating myself and looking back. I had to look back and see where did I, where did somebody like, besides the entire process, what were the things I wish they would have took a little more time on? And so when now when sellers contact me, the first thing I want to know is, tell me about yourself. Tell me about your family. It's, I'm putting the client first. It has nothing to do with me. I need to know who I'm working with. Mm -hmm. And then it goes to, okay, where are you going? Because we can't list your house if I don't know where you're going, because there's a lot of steps that have to take play when you're talking about, well, we want to also purchase. Okay. So we're talking about potentially a contingency offer. 
that looks mm -hmm. very different than if it's a seller and they're like, well, we're just going to go rent for a little bit and then we're going to buy, you know, later on down the road. So once you have an honest conversation with who the client is, what their needs and wants are, then I'm able to structure their selling process based on their life. What works for you? Whether it be, I met with a seller yesterday. I need to stay in this house until my kids are done with uh, school. Mm -hmm. Great. Here's how we can accomplish that. It's a divorce situation. One person wants their equity out of the home. Wife needs to stay in the home until kids are out of school. Let's let's come up with solutions. I'm very solution driven. Yeah. If we put your home on the market, let's say in three weeks for you to get time to declutter, depersonalize, get the housekeeper in, get some fresh landscaping, you know, tidy up the property. I can put in agent remarks that you're going to need a lease mm -hmm. back until the end of school. She's like, so oh. now you're only dealing with buyers who understand that and that's what they'll be okay with. It's putting the information up front. So we don't find ourselves in a position where we get a buyer and they're mm -hmm. like, no, I need to, I need my, I need to move in right away. I like to get all the information from my client up front. So then the buyer knows what they're working with. If we can list your house, let's say in March at some point, if we get a buyer the first day, Contract to close is about 30 days. So now we're in April. That buyer is going to know you need a lease back because we're going to close on the property and now you become a tenant. And by mm -hmm. the way, we will try and work out a free lease back for you because I understand your situation. I too have been divorced. Mm -hmm. And then husband gets said equity. He's happy. You mm -hmm. get to stay in the home until the end of May. You and your kids are happy. It's a meeting of the minds and both people get exactly what they want. That's so beautiful. Um, you know, you, you, you know, educating the client up front is so essential to not only a successful transaction, but a better experience. And I think that's so often overlooked because too many times and this isn't, this isn't all agents, but there are agents who forget that we're dealing with the person and they're thinking about the transaction only. Um, but there's no empathy for the person and what they are experiencing in their lives. And so I love that you're using education uh, at front and center to gain enrollment uh, from your customers and and essentially make them feel better about the entire process. Um, let's, let's, let's go into luxury properties for a moment. Um, you know, that topic, every time you bring up luxury, it, it's, it's the, it's what most people aspire to. Uh, and it's, it's kind of the, it's the sexiness of our business. You know, this luxury is the sexy part of real estate. Uh, but what has been your experience, Alicia, with those customers? Um, because I would presume the vast majority of them also have the same concerns, the same cares, the same interests as most people. Yes. So working with luxury is it's the same, but different, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. The process is going to be the same, but there are other conversations that we have to have. The first one is days on market at a luxury price. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with, for here in Texas, and I know it's different in other places, but anything, and this is like my version, because there are statistics on numbers, but what I consider like that luxury market where that pool of buyers is going to get slimmer is when you hit that million dollar mark and anything mm -hmm. above that, as you keep going in price, <laughs> your buyer pool goes down. And so making sure that they understand that aspect first, there are not a ton of people walking around with and able to buy a three, four five million dollar home, not even a million dollar home. Mm -hmm. So let's, you know, look at, and I look at days on market with any client, but you and I both know with luxury, there's a, 
the higher price, it could sit on the market a little bit. Um, you're not uh, showing the property five times a week. Mm -hmm. You know, you're asking for proof of funds or a pre-approval letter before the appointment is even booked. Because oftentimes we have, to, as a listing agent, have to accompany that appointment for our clients mm -hmm. because of the value of things in the home. So having those conversations with them that, hey, yes, we're going to protect your privacy, especially for my athletes. Um, I've had, you know, I took over a listing for an athlete uh, and his family, and they weren't living here at the time. He was still playing somewhere else. So I was essentially managing everything the estate sale, getting the estate sale people, hiring those people to come in and do that portion of before we list it. Um, the contractors, making sure, checking in with them that they're doing their job to update the property and get the repairs needed before we ever even list. So there were, where as it may take a normal seller a week, two weeks, maybe three to prep a property, those luxury properties that are 5,000 plus square feet, it could take a month, three months, um, depending on what needs to be done. So again, the process is the same, but things may take longer because of the nature of the property. Um, having the conversations of, you know, when we get an offer, mm -hmm. there's going to be some negotiating, right? And in a regular, on a regular home, we might be negotiating two, three, four thousand dollars you know, in price or repairs, when you talk about luxury homes, <laughs> they could come in $25,000, dollars $100,000 under list. And so having those conversations with the sellers about, you know, what that looks like, because obviously sellers are typically attached to their home. And when you get an offer that's $100,000 or $200,000 under your list price, it, it does something to a seller. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, you know, reminding them that everything is on a grander scale. Those repairs may not be $1,000. When buyers already see regular things that we know, that's just a quick fix. Your electrician, 75 bucks. In a luxury home, you're talking, they, that automatically is $10,000, you know? So having those conversations and setting the expectation and talking to them, not only from the listing agent standpoint, but having represented buyers and what they're looking for in a luxury home is key because it gives them an idea of what's to come. And I think, again, the better they are prepared and prepped, the smoother this process is going to go. What should pro athletes be thinking about moving into 2024 in when it comes to the interest rate environment that we're currently in, we have started to see some reductions in the interest rate environment. But 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 what are you telling your your pro athlete clients um, in preparation for this year? Not just pro athletes, but I tell any any buyer right now, you buy when it makes sense for you. The interest rate you can refinance at some point when they go down because they will. So no matter who you are, you have to buy when it makes sense. Does the house that you want, have you seen it? Is it available? And are you ready to move on it? Do you have enough funds to be able to cover whatever is going to be needed for that house? I don't, yes, interest rates are important, but if it makes sense financially for you, no matter what you're buying, you buy it and you can always refinance. And that's how I live my life. When I was buying my house, I wasn't so fixed on what the interest rate was. Was the house that I wanted available? Mm -hmm. I can work out all the details and negotiations and do all those things and try and help with the interest rate because we can negotiate seller concessions to buy down your interest rate. We can, you're going to shop around and not just go with the first lender because for some people and, you know, the higher net worth clients, if you move your money to a private bank, private wealth, 
with a certain bank or move certain assets over, they'll give you a lower interest rate because now they're managing some of your assets. Well, they don't have to manage them forever, but you know, if it makes sense, there are ways around interest rates, but ultimately you buy when it makes sense for you and your family, period, point blank. Oh, that's good. That's good. Uh, I think oftentimes the media and, <sighs> and just, you know, common talk amongst people oftentimes lead to putting this 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 fear uh, into the market uh, that that really doesn't even need to exist. So I, I appreciate you 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 saying that. Um, and here's one thing that yeah. I you know I met with a buyer and they were already pre-approved last week, um, which is fine. But then I got a flyer for. A, from a lender, one of my lenders that I've worked with, they're now offering $10,000 closing costs. They, there's no income limits. They have a few other things. They're doing a free uh, a free appraisal or taking like $350 off the appraisal, like $200 towards home warranty. So it's like, hey, look, I know you're already pre-approved with your bank of choice, but look what this bank is now doing because as interest rates have fluctuated, Lenders and banks are also having to be creative to help buyers get into a home. So there are options. What are your options? And I tell people, whether you're ready to buy today or you're going to be buying, you know, in six months, meet with a real estate professional and a lender to understand your options and know what that's going to look like. Because if you don't know where you're going, you can't get there. A lot of times buyers are like, why well, I have debt. Not all debt is bad. So let's let, you know, a lender look at your financial picture and tell you, hey, right now, today, you could be pre-approved for this. But if you did X, Y and Z, you could be approved for this. And that may take three months to do, but it gets you where you want to be. So a lot of people think like, I don't want to talk to anybody because I'm not ready today. I have conversations with buyers all the time that they're not necessarily ready today, but let's have the conversation. So A, you educate yourself on the process, you get with the lender so that they can look at your financial picture and tell you, yes, here's the numbers, here's what it would look like today. If we got seller concessions to take down your rate, your rate could go down to this. But if you're not asking, you don't know where you're going. So mm -hmm. get with somebody and ask the questions so you can understand like what this process is going to look like and how it may have may or may not affect your financial ability to do so. Inventory levels. Um, what is that like in Houston right now? Are you guys seeing a seller's market, buyer's market balance? Where, where, where are you guys right now? It really depends on where you're at. I always tell clients real estate is hyper local. What Bel Air is doing or Memorial or River Oaks, that's not what Sienna, where I live, is doing. So understanding where you want to be is the first step in me giving you data on, hey, this is a seller's market or it's balanced or, hey, this is a buyer's market. Right now, I think it's it's still a buyer's market in some and for most parts because sellers understand mm -hmm. interest rates are a little higher. So buyer, I haven't written a contract. I couldn't tell you in probably over a year where I'm not automatically asking for seller concessions. Mm -hmm. And I have yet to be told no to zero. It may not be the full amount we're asking, but getting some type of seller concessions has been the norm for the contracts that I have written. We may not get all, but we're at least getting some because I sellers also understand, hey, the rates are a little higher. And if we want to sell, we have to give a little more. But there are situations in the inside the loop, what we call in the city, you put a home on the market and it goes right away and mm -hmm. you're not getting those seller concessions and the luxury market is still booming in those areas in the city. So it just really depends on where you are. So I say, scratch the national <laughs> news, scratch the even local news. Mm -hmm. Where are you wanting to be? And let's look at those numbers. Uh, are you guys also seeing uh, 
a lot of new inventory come out of the ground right now? Mm -hmm. New construction? Yeah, new construction. Absolutely. <laughs> and they go up fast. But what I have mm -hmm. noticed in the suburbs, you're getting less, but the price is still higher because the average price point of a home has gone up in Houston. So where I there's a little small community within my community community that's being built and you're talking 1400 1500 square feet close mm -hmm. to $400,000. Oh wow. <laughs> okay. Like you know and it's like but the house is so small you it's like a 40 foot lot you're not getting much backyard but it's $400,000 base price like 380. Um mm -hmm. So you're seeing new construction pop up. And I'm also seeing a lot of small, more private builders that may not do volume like a big builder, like a Perry or a DR Horton. But, you know, they may do 10 to 20 homes a year. They're popping up a lot in the city. And I'm seeing a lot of like in the areas that are being revitalized, a lot of duplexes pop up new construction. But even those starting at half a million dollars. Mm. So there are opportunities. You just have to find the right one and that works for you. All the more reason to call Alicia Jammer. That's for sure. <laughs> Sorry, you froze. Am I frozen? No, oh, you're you good. Go. You're okay. good. You're good. Uh, no, I was just saying all the more reason to call you when they're <laughs> ready to get out there so that they know where to look for these opportunities. Um, last question I have for you. What advice would you give a young professional athlete? And it doesn't even necessarily just have to be for a professional athlete, uh, but um, a young person getting started with their investor journey. Uh, what, what, what should they be thinking about doing today to prepare themselves for this, their transition? The first thing is seek knowledge. And I think a lot of athletes don't do that. Um, they rely on everybody else to kind of tell them the information and seeking knowledge for yourself to be able to then compare that to what your team is saying is important because you want to understand whether you're at the beginning of your investor journey or at the, you know, towards the end of your career, you're just now starting. You want to know what you're doing. So not relying on other people to give you information and say, oh, yeah, do this, do this, do that. Ask questions. Talk to multiple people. It's OK to interview multiple agents to find the right fit. It's OK to, um, you know, talk to your financial advisor and your agent and get the information from them but then do your own homework. And that's the biggest thing that I think I've seen is because we, we did that. Mm -hmm. I believed everything, what they said and not finding out the information for myself. So seeking knowledge, do your own research, talk to multiple agents, talk to find out who the experts are. And it, there's not just one, there's plenty. Talk to many and see who you vibe with, who's going to work well with your team. You know, understand like there was a an agent that had reached out to me that had maybe wanted me to kind of partner with her because she had a, a referral from another agent in another state had an athlete and they were like my budget's two million dollars they want to buy real estate and the budget was two million dollars and I said well have have we had a conversation with the financial advisor because yes the client may have two million dollars but I've also seen where and it's not even just with athletes well, I have this amount of money, but when you really talk to them, it's, but I don't want to spend that much money. Mm -hmm. I get mm -hmm. pre-approved for $800,000, but hey, we're only comfortable spending six. Mm -hmm. So I was like, have we had conversations with said athlete and financial advisor to find out if $2 million is really the budget? Because there's a lot of things you can, is it commercial properties? Is it residential is it, you know, mini apartments? Is it a duplex? Where Where is he looking? Is it just in Houston? Is maybe only 500 allocated to Houston, but maybe a million's allocated somewhere else? Like, mm -hmm. you got to really work with people's team to find out, like, 
what really they are trying to do because having a taking a budget of two million dollars can take you down a lot of avenues um so you know working with the team to figure out okay what are we going to do and then present options have people present you options this again you don't have to just work with one person have options and have checks and balances for those options to make sure that they make sense for you i've seen over the years i've seen a lot of athletes for and i can speak for the nfl i don't know what it's like for other sports but within five years of an nfl player being retired Mm -hmm. it's like a staggering like almost 90 percent yeah no money and divorced so somewhere along the way, there were no checks and balances. You know what I mean? And so yeah. somewhere yeah. along the way, you didn't plan for your future. Um, somewhere along the way, people told you things that probably weren't true that you believed. So mm. setting yourself up, I, I say you're never too busy to understand your own affairs. Mm. You ain't that busy. Right. So you know, understanding what's going on with your money. Seek, I say, seek knowledge, ask questions, do your own research, talk to multiple people, whether it's realtors, agents, advisors, talk to multiple people so you can understand what's going on with, because if you're not managing, if your money's not being managed properly while you're playing, it's going to go really quick when you're not. Mm Mm-hmm. Alicia Jammer, you bought some reality today, didn't you? (laughs) Just a little, but it's, real estate is so much fun. No day is alike. You know that. Um, I think anybody in this business can attest. It is a really cool job to be able to be part of anyone's journey down the path of home ownership or they're selling because it's, it's an emotional tie, whatever they're doing. And so to be able to navigate people through a piece of their financial portfolio, because buying a house is part of that portfolio, mm-hmm. is really, really cool and special. And I don't take it for granted. And we so do appreciate just the knowledge and um, insight uh, that you were able to share with us today and Um, I am certain that the audience gained a lot of nuggets today. That's for sure. Well, Well, I hope so. so. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, no, I'm certain. I'm certain about it. But thank you so much for your time. Uh, You've been wonderful. And um, we'll see you next time, Alicia. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you.